So I'm going to sort of block in basically a crescent shape. So we have to imagine a, the surface of the sphere is round all the way around. So we end up with something more like a curve. So it's not going to be a straight, it would be a straight line if it was halfway across the sphere. But because the sphere is always turning in every direction, we end up with this crescent shaped shadow. So I'm just lightly laying that in now. Now the placement of this could vary. As I say, I could have made it a lot higher up. It could be a lot lower down and a lot more of the sphere could be illuminated. But for this exercise, generally um, we go for a sort of maybe three quarter, two thirds or so are illuminated and one third is not illuminated in the sphere. So this line here becomes our um, boundary between where the sphere is in light and where the sphere is in shadow. And this type of shadow has a name. So it's called a form shadow. The reason it's called a form shadow is it's a shadow that occurs because the form is turning away from the light source. Um, and the other type of shadows, the two major types of shadows, are form shadows, so this one, and cast shadows. Cast shadows are a bit easier to understand. A cast shadow is like your shadow if it's a sunny day as you as you kind of walk through a field, you cast a shadow onto the ground. And a cast shadow occurs because one object is blocking the light from hitting another object. So in the case of you walking, your body is blocking the sun from hitting the ground, so that casts a shadow. Um, so that's a, a fairly straightforward type of shadow um, for everyone to imagine. If you think of a sundial as well, it just relies on a cast shadow. So we're going to put a cast shadow into this scenario as well. Um, we're going to make that up too. And what we're going to end up with is a sort of ellipse shape. So a, a kind of flattened circle is an ellipse. And that ellipse shape is going to curve around and meet the bottom of the sphere. And I'm going to place it roughly like that. <coughs> so I'm just placing everything fairly fuzzily, these shadows, the edges of these shadows for this situation. It's so fairly loosely, I'm not pressing too hard, it allows me to, to erase things. So we've got our cast shadow in place now, we've got our form shadow. Um, I'm gonna, I'll probably label all these different portions of it later, but for now I'll, I'll just leave it unlabeled. So those are our, our shadows. And in the form, this is our, our light on the form. The other thing that we can pop in Actually, no, we won't do that. We'll just do a, a basic a basic uh, sphere. Sometimes you can put a background in, but for the sake of kind of moving on to the next um, portion of the course, it's probably better not to. Um, just going to get my eraser. I'm going to neaten up my... So I feel like the bottom edge, just by feel the bottom edge of this ellipse is maybe a little bit too low, so I just want to pick that up a bit. You can tweak, tweak these shadow shapes a little bit if they don't quite feel like they're sitting right. So I've now got my cast shadow in and my form shadow in. And the first thing that we do, so this is the way we break down um, a sort of classical drawing process. Um, it's sort of a, generally considered to be a French academic process of drawing. There's lots of variations of this. Um, it sort of grew out of um, basically tenebrist painting, so um, a chiaroscuro um, type painting, so Rembrandt or um, Caravaggio, this type of very stark light and dark, and then that's your starting point and you kind of render from there. It's a very efficient way to render naturalistic things. Um, there are variations on it. A lot of other Renaissance painters don't necessarily adhere to this sort of um, method. So if you look at Renaissance painting, it tends to be everything is a bit more illuminated the way forms work, not so shadow based. Um, Kieran, could I ask a question? Um, you see the cast shadow, is that generally just um, completely horizontal with the bottom of the form? It wouldn't come down any lower than, you know, so it's really just going out. That's what I'm trying to get that right in mind. Is, is it really, it shouldn't dip any lower than the... Yeah, I mean, it, it's a little bit something you kind of do by feel. Um, 
what I would say is you'd have to imagine it would change position depending on the direction of the light. So if the light was coming from behind the sphere, the shadow would probably extend out kind of lower down and closer towards us because we'd be looking at the shadow moving towards us. Um, okay. It's So the placement of the car shadow, in this case, it works roughly in this position. If it was, if it was on the left side, you'd reverse it. Um, yeah. If it was more illuminated from our side you'd probably push the shadow further back behind so it's kind of you're sort of trying to imagine where all these basically all these light rays are kind of flowing down and some of them do hit the ground and some of them don't hit the ground so there's a certain point where the, the light rays that would be kind of falling down on the side of the sphere nearest to us would maybe hit the ground there but if i pulled it forward it feels a little bit i'm mainly doing it by feel it just feels a little bit too low yeah. Um, okay. so you can kind of do it instinctively. Um, as I say, if you were working in a, in a realistic sort of, um, or if you, if you were working from life, you'd have all this laid out for you. So you would be observing the shadows and how they occur, um, mm -hmm. rather than having to make it up. So in this particular instance, it's, it's just us trying to like figure it out. So once you start to lay it in, if you look at it and it feels a bit wonky or it doesn't quite feel right, it might just be that the shadow needs to be a little bit narrower. It's generally sort of safer to kind of err on the side of the shadow being kind of small-ish yeah. and quite flat. Um, it tends to feel like it fits a bit better. Um, yeah, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah, so we've got our, our shadows distinct from the light shape now. Um, and what we want to do is now basically add an extra tone in. So we're going to add a, a shadow tone in. And I'm going to do that sort of together. So I'm just going to put a really light tone that just runs over both of these cast and form shadows together. So when we first lay the shadow in, we don't want to put any distinction between what's light or what's dark. So we're just going to merge them together. I'm just doing that in a few little passes over, gradually building the tone up. You don't have to shade in this exact way um, that I'm shading. So you can do it however, however you're comfortable shading. Feel free to work that way. So initially what I end up with is this basically sort of like a single shadow shape now that's made up of the merged form shadow and the merged and the cast shadow. Um, so what we're doing is we're trying to break down the process into as many steps as possible um, and also starting to look at the different aspects of, of the shadows and the, the half tones and the lights. This process, so this is, as I say, a very slow process, very broken down. Um, as you work, you don't have to do everything exactly in this order. So the more that you get familiar with this way of painting and drawing, the more you can start to merge things as you work and kind of combine steps. But it's always very useful to know how far broken down each step can be. So we're sort of just doing everything really gradually, finding just the shadow shapes, then shading all the shadow shapes in. So. I'm just shading the shadow shape up to a kind of mid-ish value. That seems okay. <clears throat> the next step is to start to look for um, variations within the shadows. So we tend to, it tends to work best to not work immediately on your lighter tones in a drawing. It's better usually to work on your darker tones um, and then move towards the lights later on. The main reason for this, and as I say, it doesn't matter so much as you get more experienced, but when you're first starting out um, with representational drawing, people have a tendency to kind of jump straight into the light parts of the drawing because they think that's the sort of main, main part of the drawing. And they tend to over model um, so overmodeling is when you, you render too much of it and it ends up looking kind of shiny or it kind of makes the form seem quite dark. Um, 
and it, it sort of tends to kill the sense of luminosity that you can get from a drawing. So if you want to try to keep a sense of sort of glowing light, it helps to not jump straight into the light tones to kind of leave that leave sort of stay back off them a little bit um, when you're first starting. So we've got this cast shadow and this form shadow. So shadows are never just totally dark. They're never flat. Um, there's still light. Um, light is still interacting with the shadow, even though the direct light is not interacting with it. Um, and this, this causes the, the shadows to be either lighter or darker in certain places. Um, the first aspect of the shadow um, that we can look at is sort of a combination of um, what we call reflected lights. Um, and reflected lights cause this thing called the bed bug line or the terminator, which is this edge of the shadow. Um, so I was always taught it was called the bed bug line because apparently bed bugs run along the light, the line between light and dark cast on the ground. So they're harder to see because they run along the edge of the shadow. So the edge of the shadow essentially. So it's that point where we're no longer, the form is no longer receiving direct light. That's our bed bug line, sometimes called terminator. So um, that part of the, the shadow it's not receiving much, it's not receiving any direct light because it's the beginning of the shadow, but it's also not receiving any reflected light. So reflected light occurs when, so this ball is sitting on a, a ground plane. The light rays are all kind of streaming down onto the, sort of past the ball. Some of them are going to hit the ground and light rays always move around so they never just move in a fixed direction and disappear. Some of them will be absorbed but some of them will be reflected. And lighter surfaces reflect more. So if this is on a white tabletop, it's going to be maybe reflecting a lot of light back up. Um, so those light rays that get reflected up are going to do the opposite of what the direct light source is doing here inside the shadows. So what we end up with is there's going to be a portion of the shadow which is illuminated by reflected lights. And these are, these are called our reflected lights. And it's going to sort of be the inversion of here. So if this is our lightest light tone, then there's going to be a lightest uh, reflected light tone down here in the shadows. Um, and what's interesting and sort of a bit counterintuitive is the bed bug line doesn't receive much reflected light either. So it doesn't receive any direct light and it receives less reflected light than the part of the sphere that curves down towards the ground. So what you end up with is a darkening at the bed bug line. And this is really crucial to be aware of and to kind of look out for when you're drawing and painting. Um, because what people often do is they, they create their shadows and they just blend straight out of their shadows and it's sort of darkest, the furthest away from the light that it is and then it gets lighter as it goes towards um, the light and you, they lose this bed bug line, this darker edge. Um, so what you often get is a darkening at that uh, bed bug line or at that terminator. You also will tend to get, so you can imagine, because this part of the ball, this part of the shadow is down closer nearer to the ground, it's going to be illuminated more by the reflected lights than this bit up here. So this section up here is going to be also going to be darker than the base of the sphere. So I can create, put a little gradient in, so I'm kind of working my way down, getting gradually less heavy with my hand which is making a lighter tone as I go down. So I'm gradually starting to roll that tone down towards the ground. And I can also do a little bit more on this, this bed bug line. So also the bed bug line, do the same thing. I'm doing a sort of curved line, kind of cross hatching now. And that's also gradually getting lighter as it goes further across. <clears throat> 
and we're also going to get a little bit of a sort of darkening. So as the as the form of the sphere turns away, um, it's going to be a little bit darker at this edge too, um, but only slightly, because we want to try to make the core of the shadow in here more have the most reflected light. This wouldn't happen in all circumstances if if um, the light was brightest sort of right at this edge, then that very, that very edge would be um, would be the lightest part. But it, it usually works well to to make the lightest portions of your forms inside the form, not at the very edge. Um, so that's called crest lighting versus uh, rim lighting or edge lighting. So if something is edge lit, it's illuminated right at the edge of the form. Those forms tend not, they tend to be harder to get to read as three dimensional. Um, whereas something that's crest lit like this is easier to make it look three dimensional. So I'm just gonna just keep doing that, keep reinforcing those variations that we're looking at. And a few little kind of drawing tips for this type of drawing. If you if you hold your pencil quite far back, so I'm holding my pencil right right back at the the sort of tip of it or the, the back end of it. So it stops me from pressing down too hard. If you hold your pencil very high up more like a pen, it makes it a little bit trickier to to be very um, sort of light with your the way that you apply tone. So if you're trying to do this sort of gradual application, it's trickier. So that's not too bad as our initial block in. We've got our bed bug line. Um, yeah, we've got our bed bug line in place up here. We're gonna we're gonna rework this um, later, but we just want to roughly get everything blocked in at this stage. I'm also just gonna just gonna check my focus. It seems ever so slightly. Out of focus. That seems a bit better. Yeah, so we've got our bed bug line in place and we've got our reflected light starting to be worked on. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is shade in our cast shadow. So the cast shadow is going to go a little bit darker than the reflected light. That's because it's not receiving, it's kind of blocked out from the direct light source. And it might receive a little bit of secondary reflected light, so it sort of light is bouncing up, hitting the, the sort of core of the shadow. Some of it might bounce back down and light the, the cast shadow, but not a lot of it. And it's not going to be as much light as is hitting hitting the sphere, so we're going to go moderately dark with that. And it can be more of a flat tone. I'm just going to adjust the edge of that shadow. It feels a little bit too low still. It feels a little bit better, slightly higher up. 
So we've got our cast shadow now, and as I said, that's just shaded into a kind of moderate darkness. Darker than the reflected lights. And the next type of shadow we're going to look at, so, or aspect of the shadows. The first one being the bedbug line, second one being reflected light. The next one is called an occlusion shadow. Um, and basically you get these points sometimes in, sit, in situations that you might draw where there's no reflected light reaching the shadow. So mostly there'll be some reflected light bouncing around and illuminating parts of the shadow um, in the drawing. But there are certain points, um, usually not that many, um, where just absolutely no light is reaching. So one instance of this, or what would likely be happening is, as this ball, ball is sort of, or the sphere is rolling down, the form is rolling down and moving towards the, um, the ground plane, um, there's a certain point where very little light is able to kind of bounce around and reflect because it's getting tucked under. It's a bit like a crease and you tend to get, um, you, you tend to get occlusion shadows at creases um, because it's two forms kind of rolling in towards each other and meeting and there's just a point where light kind of can't escape um, or can't move around so it ends up very dark. So the darkest point in this drawing is going to be our occlusion shadow where the ball rolls down and meets the ground plane. So that's going to make the shadow on the ground pretty dark. It's also going to make the very bottom of the sphere very dark as well. But only just just as it emerges out of that occlusion shadow, very quickly it's going to kind of rapidly be curving up and then catching reflected light again. So it's just this very little and tiny bottom edge. So already you can sort of see that has quite a big impact on how the, the sphere kind of seems to sit and sort of pop off the, the ground. So that's called an occlusion shadow. So that's reasonably nicely blocked in now. Um, and that almost finishes up um, the shadows that we're looking at. So well, there's one sort of final aspect of the cast shadow that I'm going to go over and that's um, called the penumbra. So the, the portion of the shadow, just as the shadow kind of exits or ends um, when it's a cast shadow, you get this sort of softening out and the softening tends to increase the further away the cast shadow gets from the object casting it. Um, so in this case, this kind of portion of the, the cast shadow is further away from the sphere than this little bit where the occlusion shadow is. Um, and basically what happens, what we're sort of thinking about is the light rays, generally light rays will move in one direction, but sometimes you'll get rays that scatter around um, variously in, in different directions. So I'll just zoom, I'm going to zoom out a tiny bit for this. So some light rays might be kind of moving in this direction, some might be kind of moving in that direction. and the further away the cast shadow gets from the object casting it, the less, so almost like the less certain the light rays are of exactly where they're going to hit. So you get this fuzzing out, the sort of softening out of the shadow. You can sort of see it if I put my, my finger on the paper here. It's quite sharp there and then as I gradually lift my finger off, it sort of softens. So that's, that's the penumbra getting softer and softer and as I get closer it gets sharper. Um, so if, if I'm casting a shadow down, say here, you can see it softens out the further away it gets from my finger. Um, and that's an important sort of effect to look for when you're working with objects next, sort of sitting on top of other objects or next to and casting shadows. Um, so what that means is we're going to go for our shadow edge is going to be sharper, not necessarily darker than what we've already got, 
more crisp right up next to the, the sphere. And then it's going to get softer and sort of fade out further away, the further away it goes. So we've got that kind of gradual fading out of the shadow at that edge. And that pretty much sort of finishes up our our shadows in this uh, sphere. Um, one thing you would maybe do if you were kind of carrying on, um, I'm going to try to move on to the next stage quite soon because we're at about, actually we're not doing too bad for time. Yeah, so we can maybe spend a little bit of time, I thought it was later than it was, a little bit of time just sort of darkening and unifying these shadows a little bit. So just a few more passes to even them out. 